So, kind of big news. Uh, Seymour Rocks has done a video about this. In fact, it's linked in this article. But it's been around, you know, on Facebook and Twitter. But quickly, before I get into it, this is from uh, Climate Variab- Variability, uh, or Zach Lab via Climate Variability, um, via Variability. Say that 10 times fast. Siberian sea ice in July. Look at that. Look at that. Again, this is just Siberian sea ice, but that is down to the, right down to the nitty gritty or the bottom, if you will. Um, fairly amazing stuff. And Zach Lab isn't one to post misinformation. So we're going to, you know, we're, this is, you know, actual data for your consideration. Um, and let's move on to this. Um, this is via... This is from Robin Robin Westenra, or Seymour Rocks did a video, did did a blog post, but this is via Facebook as well. So I'm going to read through this, but I'm going to have to say that I went to the Danish Meteorological Institute site and I couldn't couldn't find these graphs or any of this stuff anywhere. So if I am... Not just just not clicking on the right link or the right button. If if anybody knows any more about this, uh, or can confirm this story, that would be great. But I'll read through it anyways. Uh, this is from today. Open waters at North Pole expected in ninety hours. Right now, I cannot think of anything that matters more uh, than most. The end of the road, North Pole, and open waters now expected within ninety hours or less. This is apparently. From the Danish Meteorological Institute forecast, blue waters are reaching the North Pole within 90 hours. Okay, that's... Uh, so, we have seen many satellite aerial photographs of the ice receding away from the north of Greenland and the Canadian archipelago, right? So, it is... The ice cap is detaching um, from most of the places where it is you know, usually up against the land. Uh, so this is from Veli Albert Calio via Facebook, Danish Meteorological Institute, forecast blue waters reaching the North Pole within 90 hours. Ships can now sail in open water all the way to the 90 degree north within 90 hours from the eastern direction. The ice cap is also detached from all land connections. Uh, First time ever stranding polar bears at sea on ice flows driven away from the land. Many bears are falling into soft ice and perishing right now. Nuclear, nuclear submariners have, are having difficulties hiding their submarines as open water is reaching them almost anywhere and risk of collisions between U.S. and Russian submarines is growing. Being also... Passes in close proximity engine noises. I, th- there's a weirdly written sentence here. In close proximity engine noises are, are also revealing locations. Sea ice on eastern flank of Greenland and north have, of it have both spectacular, spectacularly collapsed. So this is uh, another satellite image. And yes, the ice is looking quite broken up. Collapse of North Pole ice cap is falling. <clears throat> uh, August 4th, 2020. Fast like house of cards falling down. Ice blocks heading now to North Atlantic warm waters. One 100 meters thick ice shelf also collapsed yesterday with 81 kilometer, uh, kilometers long iceberg coming. And here's another graph showing... Sea ice melt extent ratio, and this is 2020, and we're at an, a high here. 
So, you know, that's all. I, I Generally, Seymour Rocks has... Um, has pertinent information, has good information. So uh, this is concerning uh, for sure. But we've been seeing the you know Arctic ice going down um, at an amazing rate and faster than we've ever seen it before. It's at its lowest. Sea ice extent is at its lowest ever, ever, ever. Um, and we are seeing other satellite data coming in saying that the, you know, the ice is retreating from, uh, land or retreating from shores again, though, when I went to, when I went to, to the DMI, I couldn't find any of these graphs anywhere. So I, if I'm looking in the wrong place or if I've missed the, the link or the connection, somebody please help me out. If anybody else is confirming this coming from the Danish meteorological uh, site, um, that would be great. I don't know. Environmental Coffeehouse says, yeah, not much on Twitter about this. I've, yeah, it's like I saw it. I got a couple links, and I saw it on Facebook, and I'm seeing it on Seymour Rocks, but I'm not seeing it anywhere else. So I, I don't want to put this out there as, you know, this is possibly not true. Or maybe doesn't have um, other evidence or data to back it up. <clears throat> oh, have I done this? I guess I have. Sorry. Oh, so I, I'm seeing that other people are having problems with Seymour Rocks. Robin Westenra is not my fan. Oh, okay. Well, you know, personal personal problems aside, we'll just, you know, uh, we'll take this for a, a report uh, about, you know, the ongoing rec receding of the Arctic ice cap. I don't know whether this is confirmed or not. So we cannot confirm this yet. The de but the, it's funny, though, because the DMI is something that climate deniers like to, they like to use fake graphs from the DMI. The Danish Meteorological Institute has said that we're at the highest extent ever, right? They, they use fake graphs from the DMI, and then you go look it up at the DMI, and you're like, I don't see this anywhere. So it's interesting when it's in the reverse, right? If somebody is, you know, ob an obvious climate science believer, and they believe that we're in climate collapse or that, you know, they're trying to alert people to the, to the issue at hand, but they're using the DMI and I can't find these graphs anywhere. So I, I maybe this is disinformation in the other direction. I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> it would suck if it was disinformation or not true. Um, uh, Yes. So, I mean, there are other, there are com confirmations of the ice, right? Sa Scott Andrews says Sam Carana posted about the ice retreating from the Greenland coast, and that is happening. That is confirmed. So, you know, parts of this are, are very true. Whether or not the, the North Pole is going to be ice free in a few days, I don't know. I don't know. Cougar W, or we are deep into disinformation space. Yeah, you really have to, you have to be very vigilant and do do your diligence and and really look, you know, almost anything that you read out there, you've got to you've got to go out and say, is this right? Can I see this coming from somewhere else? Is anybody else backing up this information? Right? You, you really have to do that because if you don't, um. You're doing it at your own peril, the peril of being duped and of, you know, retweeting things or reposting things or reporting on things. And then you're like, ah, oh, that wasn't even right at all. Missed it by that much. But yes, Keith Boyd, uh, Zach Labe has good info on this. Zach Labe is doing, you know, is, you know, coming with data and science and he's not, you know, I don't see Zach Labe. Being somebody out there who is, 
in, you know, putting disinformation out there. So, and Zach Lab has been posting some very, very concerning graphs of his own. So there you go. And <clears throat> Salt Lakers, I don't know. I don't. It just seems that people like to use the Danish site to you know back up their claims. I've seen climate deniers do that, or you know, new ice agers, or you know. Solar minimum guys. Oh, Danish Meteorological Institute says. I'm like, no, they didn't say that. You're just hoping that nobody's going to go check your your story. That's you know, and they usually they probably don't. So I don't know. Yeah, LC. There's something about that too. The conspiracy theorist in me says confirming it is hard to do due to information. Control, sure, sure. Uh, guys, give me give me one second. Sorry about that. Okay, let's move on. Um, so I'm going to read a couple of different articles today. Um, opinions about what's going on. So, or if I if I got the time, um, this is from Medium. Uh, this is from Umar Umar Hak. Who I've, who I've read before, generally does pretty good work. If life feels bleak, it's because our civilization is beginning to collapse. This is from July 3rd. 2030 will be even worse than 2020, and 2040 will be even worse than that, unless. Well, let's see what he has to say about this. There's an old line from a movie called Office Space, which one of my favorites, by the way. Do you remember that one? And I've always loved Every day since I began work is worse than the day before it. That's kind of an apt summary for everything at the moment. Life isn't a happy thing right about now. It's stressful, strange, upside down. I'm weary with boredom, exhausted by isolation, tired of all the nothing. And I bet you are too. So is it just me or living through the end of human civilization kind of sucks? There's not, or there shouldn't be by now, any real debate on the point that we are now living through the probable end of human civilization. The end of human civilization is now easy enough to see over the next three to five decades. It's made of climate change, mass extinctions, ecological collapse, and the economic depressions, financial implosions, political upheavals, pandemics, plagues, plagues floods, fires, and social breakdowns. And he, and he left war out of there. All of those will ignite. Um, coronavirus is a foreshadowing, a taste of a dismal future, a warning, and a portrait, too. Life as we know it is falling apart. Life as we know it will continue to fall apart for the rest of our lives. How do you live through that? I'm not your therapist, sadly, or luckily. <clears throat> I'm just an economist, so let me paint you a picture. What did, what did coronavirus rupture? A sense of easy normality, of stability, of placidity. That things could just go on as before. Now, at least we know how quickly life can simply come to a screeching halt. How fast everything can change. True, in some countries like America, things had been on a steady downward trajectory anyways. But don't mistake the crucial lessons or crucial lesson of the pandemic life as we know it, it has now come to an end. That's not to say lockdowns and so forth will last forever, but they won't end like we all secretly hope overnight either. They'll be with us in fits and starts as the virus ebbs and flows for years, or at least until a vaccine's ready. It takes about five to ten years to develop one, usually. So corona will probably define this decade, sapping the life from economies, causing a depression here, a stagnation there, another one here, yet again there, draining the cohesion from societies as people grow tired of yet another lockdown, redefining politics, shifting power to authoritarians and nationalists, ripping a connected, cooperative world apart. But that's just a tiny, tiny taste of what's to come. Corona caused our lives to come to a standstill, but by and large, our systems still work. That's not to say we have great magnificent and magnificent, 
great and magnificent systems, or even really good ones, but mostly <clears throat> they were kept functioning. Systems, meaning social, economic, and financial systems from healthcare to banks to jobs to wages and pensions and so on. Those are what I'll call in this tiny essay superficial or secondary systems. That's not to say that they're unimportant. It's to say that they depend on other deeper systems, but I'll come to that. Um, sounds like this is going to be long, but I'm going to, I'm going to do the, um, the Black Bear News speed reading version of this. A decade from now, by the 2030s, uh, climate change is going to go nuclear. <clears throat> from relatively mild, although already badly disruptive, to catastrophic. And as it does, where it does, when it does, so too all those systems we depend on will simply rupture and break. Suddenly, bang. Just like coronavirus did to our lives, but not our systems today. Tomorrow, the difference will be that those systems will come to a halt, not just our temporary access to them. They will be offline, crashed, broken, devastated, wrecked, depleted, bankrupt, and paralyzed. What happens when a continent burns? Take the example of America or Australia. Both have already had an experience of megafires. Luckily, they've been managed to be controlled or have burned themselves out. By the 2030s, though, we won't be so lucky. Megafires will be a regular seasonal event, and they will just go on raging through canyons and hills and plains. What then? Well, when financial systems sim simply break, who's going to pay for the costs of repairing millions of incinerated homes, schools, offices, universities, clinics? The answer is nobody. <clears throat> just like we have Rust Belt towns today, places that are being abandoned by, by deindustrialization, so too We'll have fire belt and flood belt towns and cities and villages tomorrow. And, or how about um, <clears throat> sea level rise towns as well, or king tide towns. And as those places are destroyed, they're going to take financial systems, healthcare systems, jobs, incomes, pensions, wages, and so forth with them. Not temporarily like now during the pandemic, but for good. Just like rust belt towns have been abandoned, so tomorrow's fire and flood belt towns uninhabitable and the exodus fleeing from it from it will break most of our superficial systems banks won't be able to cope with the costs of insuring all that healthcare systems with the cost of treating all the ill employment systems with providing for all those people energy grids with the wreckage and so on bang there go a civilization superficial superficial systems of course some places will be lucky and they'll escape much of this damage canada scandinavia just some of the beneficiaries you know, I kind of actually doubt. <laughs> I th I feel like those places will be hit just as hard and just as well. But they are a tiny relative pro proportion of humanity. The losers will be immense in number. And our systems simply don't have the capability to cope, to provide, to offer them income, shelter, housing, medicine, food, even in rich countries. What happens then? A depression does. Welcome to the climate depression of the 2030s. It's much, much worse than the Great Depression, so-called, of the 1930s. Since huge chunks of the planet are now the fire and flood belt, huge portions of humanity have nowhere to live, nothing to subsist on, and no way to earn a living either. Demand falls through the floor, and the vicious cycle of falling incomes and lower employment sets in with a vengeance. How much does that kind of life suck? A lot more than now. That's not to say today is fun. Uh, but tomorrow is going to make it look like a fond memory. Uh, what are you going to do when the banking system, healthcare system, pension system all break down? It's okay. You'll make it. It won't be fun, but you'll probably survive. You're well off enough to be reading this, right? It's the next decade you really have to worry about. By the 2040s, mass extinction will finally begin to bite. Um, climate change will have destabilized temperatures and seasons enough that the current rate of mass extinction, which is already horrifically high, will explode. Did you know fish can't spawn when water, water are too warm? Waters are too warm. Water is too warm. That's okay. We're overfishing them to death anyways. Life on the planet Earth will, by the 2040s, begin to keel over from the bottom. Its great towers and chains of life will crash and topple, having had the roots and foundations ripped out from under them. All the little things are dying off, fastest and first. Insects, bees, 
fish, worms, and so forth. But all those chains and ladders of subsistence right up to us depend on them. <clears throat> Who's going to turn the soil when the worms are gone? Who's going to clean the rivers from turning to mud when the fish are gone? Who's going to nourish the plants that keep the forest healthy when the insects are gone? The answer is nothing. Nothing is. Bang. Life on planet Earth begins to die off. Oops. We're part of that too. Now the real fireworks begin. I talked about our superficial or secondary systems. Now our primary systems, the most fundamental ones, begin to break, go bankrupt, end up depleted, crash, burn, energy, air, food, water, medicine, the things which keep us clean, nourished, fed, watered, alive in the most basic ways. Those systems now begin to break down. The soil turns to dust, no har harvest, no food. Are you guys depressed yet? <laughs> now you have to comp compete bitterly just for food. The rivers turn to mud because the fish are gone. Now clean water becomes a luxury. Raw materials become inaccessible. The basic compounds medicines are made of become scarce and so forth. What happens then? Right about now, you pay maybe 25% 20 per, of your income for these basics. Water, food, energy, air, and so on. Oh, I think 25% might be low. Maybe more if you're relatively poor. But by then, most of your income, easily upwards of 50%, will go to these basics. The price of all these things will skyrocket because there simply won't be enough to go around, and having a steady supply of them will seem like a luxury. Now you, the rich person of the world back then in the 2020s, are learning what it is like to live like a poor person globally always did. They always had to carefully ration their food, water, energy, medicine. Do I wash dishes today or do I bathe? Do I eat or do I trick, treat my sick kid? Those are the decisions the poor 80% of humanity always lived with. You were lucky not to. Maybe you didn't know it. Now you live like them too, making just those choices. Between the very basics, over and over again, every day, rationing, squeezing, cutting out every last morsel of waste trying to conserve. Don't worry, you'll probably succeed at that. You're resourceful enough. The problem is that when you're spending most of your income on the basics, then what do you save? And what do you have left over to invest in? Never mind having fun. You're living like one of the global poor now, which is what climate change and mass extinction will make nearly everyone. It's not that they don't have fun, but they don't spend a lot of money on it. For, na for you, now, subsistence has become the daily project, mission, goal. The old goals of saving, investing, maybe splurging, are all, though, the, all those are distant, distant memories. What's that kind of life like? It's not pleasant, that's for sure. It has its moments of happiness and even abandon and joy. But by and large, it's what it sounds like, a bitter, desperate struggle for mere subsistence. You'll get through it. Maybe you'll learn something new about the value of human connection, of warmth, of simpler things. It's the next decade that you really have to worry about. The 2050s, haha, <laughs> will be the age of the final goodbye. By now, Earth's great ecosystems will be in irreversible and catastrophic decline. The ocean currents, the reefs, what little is left of the polar ice, the forests, which are the Earth's lungs, will be charred. The rivers, which are its veins, will have turned to dust. The prairies, which are its limbs, will be made of flood water. The oceans, which are its organs, will be bitter with acid. The final goodbye, as in there's no coming back from this. Sure, life on Earth will survive in some form, but not as we know it and not in the way that we depend on it. It will be very, very different. Maybe jellyfish, the inedible kind, will roam the seas. Maybe bacteria that thrive in heat will live in the embers of the permanent megafires. Who knows? What's for certain is this. Now, the collapse of our civilization's primary systems of energy, air, food, water, and medicine goes permanent and goes nuclear. Do you know how to put the ocean back together? A rainforest, a prairie, neither do I. Once they're gone, they're gone. And having gone, so are the most basic of things they nourish us with, energy, air, water, food, medicine, and so on. As those critical resources begin to, to be depleted for good, our systems will crash. How do you price food or water when there's not enough to go around for good? The answer is you don't. You take it if you can, and if you can't, you die. Our carefully planned technocratic systems from the techni technical end, markets, prices, algorithms, currencies, options, to the practical end, stockpiles, pipes, reservoirs, and so forth, all simply crash, break, fall apart. They are no good anymore. What good is a price for the last antibiotic in a country? What good is a healthcare system full of finely educated and trained managers and accountants and CEOs for allocating antibiotics or operations when there aren't going to be any more? Maybe you see my point. Nobody cares now, even if you have money, because money is just the polite and agreeable fiction of a civilized society. 
Now all that matters is power and the will to use it. Now things break down in big, big ways. Nations fall apart. The cities and towns turn on one another. The idea of democracy comes to an end and tribalism, factionalism, every kind of stupid and backward superstition from the depth, depths of history replaces it. All that's left is everyone against everyone else, each tribe for themselves, and a desperate, doomed, idiotic battle for the last few morsels of life, life-giving stuff left on a planet that's turning to dust, fire, and death. Think of America right about now, how it's become this stupid, desperate, never-ending battle for self-preservation only everywhere. Corona, in its own way, is trying to prepare us for that. It's trying to teach us how not to end a civilization by taking, taking care of one another. Not in some meaningless Hallmark card kind of way, but in a razor-sharp one. Invest now in the things you will need tomorrow. All of you, food, water, air, energy, medicine, where do they come from? From the lungs, limbs, organs, blood of the earth, the forests, skies, oceans, rivers. From the creatures, the animals, beginning with the smallest, which feed and nourish the bigger, right up to us. Invest in all that. Do it now. Do it like never before in history. Put aside your stupid squabbles and your pointless pursuits. Oh, and put aside the entire consumer uh, consumer system that we have. Put inside it, the entire system of capitalism that we enjoy right now. Put that aside. If you don't, everything that uh, Umer is predicting is going to come to pass. Hey. Um, put down the remote control, the phone, the drug, the fix. You are here on planet Earth. Are you really here on planet Earth? Corona is warning from the, a warning from the end of human civilization backward in time to the beginning of the end of human civilization. It teaches us how you can see the end from here. You can see the lights going out, the lights of civilization, prosperity, democracy, freedom, justice, truth, beauty, goodness, <clears throat> all gone, incinerated by fire, drowned by flood. <clears throat> and all that's left is a desperate, stupid, terrible, idiotic struggle through the mud and ashes for self-preservation, each against each other, all against all. I take your water, you take my energy, they take our food, we take their medicine, around and around the maypole we go, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. That is how our civilization ends. Does it suck to live at the end of human civilization? Of course it does, not just because of life is wearying, boring, draining, or tense, but because you know it doesn't have to be like this, and yet it is. Maybe then it always did have to be like this. Maybe this is the only way we have to fail so they can learn. I take consolation, I suppose, in the fact that the next civilization will be, will have to be, wiser, gentler, truer, better than us. It's a shame, though, that the rest of our lives are going to, well, you know, suck. Woo! Yeah, did you, did you enjoy that? <clears throat> That bit of doom there from Umar Hak. Hak. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have uh, 184 watching, 87 likes. Thank you. Guys, uh, please like up the video. And um, if you're new to the channel, please remember to subscribe. Let's move on. We've got a few more things to cover here today. Uh, this is an interesting tweet. <clears throat> from Max Roser linking to something that is talking about the potential for co controlled environment vertical farms which is unless we save our environment as we know it this is how we're going to be growing food in the very near future indoors most likely underground um, in hydroponic Vertical hydro hydroponic farms, which are which are actually quite productive, but for how long? Um, here we show that wheat grown on a single hectare of land in a ten-layer indoor vertical facility could produce 220 to 600 times the current world average annual wheat yield of 3.2 tons per hectare. But do we do we want to live that way? <laughs> it's a question. I mean, that would be really great. And of course, a lot of people would probably point to this or point this out as a reason why we could totally feed, more, you know, billions of more people on this planet, <clears throat> maybe. Uh, again, if there's no habitat for us to su survive in, um, you know, we're going to have to get real creative about how we survive. Uh and there's been other, you know, I've read other articles about this before, you know, about different kinds of 
future food production. Scaling current cereal production to growing to a growing global population will be a challenge. Wheat supplies approximately one fifth of the, of the calories and protein for human diets. Vertical farming is possible is a possible promising option for increasing future wheat production. Here we show that wheat grown on a single hectare of land in a 10-layer indoor vertical facility. I've just read all this, actually. I'm just rereading the same numbers. But anyways, um, there are people already doing this, by the way. Um, huge, there are huge vegetable-growing facilities indoor in various cities around the world that are growing food um, at scale for you know, lots and lots of people. Um, I, you know, I don't doubt that this will be the future of how we grow and harvest our food. Um, whether we like it or not, it's already happening. It's going to continue to happen. It's probably going to, um, LC says, no, It's going to be empty calories. Folks gloss over nutrition and food. Soil health is important. Well, yes. Um, And I was going to get to that. That's, you know, how nutritious this food is, uh, how well we can live on food that is grown indoors, and how long we can actually grow food indoors is going to be of concern, right? Because we're going to assume that we have electricity, and all the other things that we need to grow food indoors, right? To control the environment, right? So it's just assuming that we're going to have, you know, envir- uh, controlled environments, AC and or heat. We're going to have, you know, this never-ending electricity supply in order to grow this food indoors, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, it's, it creates its own set of problems. Um, but, you know, it may work for a little while, right? We may go on. We may limp along for a few more decades or maybe an extra decade uh, growing food underground. I don't know. Um, but again, if, if the environment is collapsing, you know, how are we going, how are we all going to continue to carry on? Keith Hayes, it's a thermodynamic nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's going to present more problems uh, than it fixes. It's going to fix some problems for, for the, for the near term but uh is it going to create more problems yeah yeah tcr galaxy microplastics are already in the food chain yep greedy chops jellyfish mmm jellyfish i like a nice jelly filled fish uh, last monkey nuclear fusion maybe maybe Maybe, if we can control it. If we, if we can control it and if we don't kill ourselves doing it. Doomhound vertical farms and fusion reactors. Yes, of the world of the future is going to be chock full of goodness. Yes, John Ziggy Kelleher used solar to power grow lights. Sure, but yeah, that's funny. Uh, Scott Andrews, I read that food is being grown in shipping containers. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. I mean, it's being grown everywhere in all kinds of different ways. You know, there and uh, was it George Monbio just had an article maybe in the last year about the, a new food source being like growing bacteria and vats, right? Creating like a yeast kind of thing that we, you know, make food out of. Very Blade Runner-ish, or Blade Runner-esque, if you will. Uh, Anyways, let's move on, because we've got minimal time left. I wanted to read this other article. This is from last year, but... I like the headline, so, and it's pertinent to what we've been talking about and what I was talking about also yesterday about the media being um, complicit in um, climate misinformation or not really letting people understand 
the seriousness of the climate situation and what it is that we really w- will have to do in the end, which is give up capitalism and or consumerism, you know, giving, giving up pretty much entirely the system that we live in for a, an entirely different system. Um, you know, before we even can do that, people actually have to understand that in their brains. And the media is really good at helping people not understand that in their brains. The media are complacent while the world burns. This article, uh, let's see, last summer, this is from April 22nd, 2019. Last summer, during the deadliest wildfire season in California's history, MSNBC's Chris Hayes got into a revealing Twitter discussion about why U.S. television doesn't much cover climate change. Elon Green, an editor at Longform, had tweeted, Sure would be nice if our news networks, the only outlets that can force change in this country, would cover it with commensurate urgency, uh, like, say, coronavirus. Hayes, who is an editor-at-large for The Nation, replied that his program had tried which was true in 2016, all in, all in with Chris Hayes, spent an entire week highlighting the impact of climate change in the U.S. as part of a look at the issues that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were ignoring. The problem, Hayes tweeted, was that every single time we're, we've covered climate change, it's been a palpable ratings killer. Exactly. Oh, I don't, really don't want to think about that. Uh, please. You're upsetting my whole comfort level right now, okay? So, bro. So the incentives are not great. <clears throat> the Twitter sphere pounced. TV used to be obligated to put on programming for the public good, even if it didn't get good ratings. Exactly. 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 What happened to that? Asked uh, Thomas Albert or J. Thomas Albert or Gal Jaya said, your ratings killer argument against covering climate change is the reverse of that used during the 2016 primary when corporate media justified gifting Trump $5 billion in free airtime because it was good for ratings with disastrous results for the nation. When Mike Barrett, 17, urged Hayes to invite, invite Catherine Hayhoe of Texas Tech University, one of the best climate science communicators around, onto his show, she tweeted that All In had canceled her twice. Once when I was literally in the studio with an earpiece in my ear. <clears throat> and so she wouldn't waste any more time on it. Wait, we did that? Hayes tweeted back. I'm very, very sorry that happened. This spring, Hayes redeemed himself, airing perhaps the best coverage on American television yet of the Green New Deal. All In devoted its entire March 29 broadcast to analyzing the congressional resolution, co-sponsored by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Senator Ed Markey, which outlines a plan to mobilize the United States to stave off climate disaster and in the process creates millions of green jobs. (laughs) <laughs> in a shrewd answer to the ratings challenge, Hayes booked Ocasio-Cortez, the most charismatic U.S. politician of the moment, for the entire hour. Yet at a time when civilization is accelerating towards disaster, climate silence continues to reign across the bulk of the U.S. news and media, and especially right now, because, you know, coronavirus, 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 and... Election, 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 and Trump, 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 blah, ba boo ba dee How dare you hijack this, this emergency, this pandemic, to talk about climate change, which is hundreds and thousands of times worse than coronavirus. How dare you? <clears throat> Especially on television, where most Americans... Still get their news. The brutal demands of ratings and money work against adequate coverage of the biggest story of our time. Many newspapers, too, are failing the climate test. Last October, the scientists of the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a landmark report warning that humanity had a mere 12 years to radically slash greenhouse gas emissions or face calamitous future. Um, We are now down to 10 years, guys, by the way, uh, in which hundreds of millions we wasted those two years. And guess what? Coronavirus showed us we can do this very, very quickly. We don't have to waste another two years. Um, A calamitous future in which hundreds of millions of people worldwide would go hungry or homeless or worse. Only 22 of the 50 biggest newspapers in the United States covered that report. 
Instead of sleepwalking us toward disaster, the U.S. news media need to remember that Paul Revere respon- their Paul Revere responsibilities to awaken, inform, and rouse the people to action. <clears throat> they won't do it because everybody is bought and sold and completely corrupt and more interested in their own comfort and fun having than actually taking action. They don't want to put their jobs on the line or themselves on the line. They, they don't want to be uncomfortable. Nobody wants to be uncomfortable. Nobody wants to be mocked, jeered, roasted, told they're crazy, not invited to parties, unfriended, unfollowed. Nobody wants all of those things. Nobody wants to be kicked out of the cool guys club. Nobody wants to lose their pension. Nobody wants to lose their health care. All those things. <clears throat> We're all cowards in the end, right? In the end, maybe the meek should inherit, will inherit the earth should be changed to the cowards will inherit the earth and then lose it. Um, when the IPCC scientists issued their 12-year warning, they said that, the limiting, that limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius would require radically transforming energy, agriculture, transportation, construction, and other core sectors of the global economy. And I really don't like this wording, radically transform. Uh, actually, you need, to act, you need to chop or get rid of or destroy or dismantle transportation, construction, and other core sectors of the, you know, consumerism. Other core sectors of the global economy need to go away, right? Energy needs to be transformed, but also reduced. Reduced by more than half, right? Energy usage or the expectation that you deserve the energy usage that you are using right now. Agriculture is probably the only thing in this thing that's really important, as in how are people going to eat? So, like, people need to start getting the language right. We're not going to transform our transportation or construction to make it more green. F that. It needs to be canceled, done away with, stopped, put on hold. Indefinitely. Our project is grounded in the conviction that the new, se- new sector must be transformed just as radically. The project will launch on April 30 with a conference. Well, I guess it's already happened. At the Columbia Journalism School, a working forum where journalists will s- gather to start charting a new course. Oh, boy. I wonder, I wonder how far they got. <clears throat> we envision this event as the beginning of a conversation that America's journalists and news... I haven't heard anything about this since then, so, you know, apparently... They didn't get very far. News organizations must, ha- much, must have with one another as well as with the public. We are supposed to be serving about how to cover this rapidly uncoiling emergency. <clears throat> well, as of right now, you know, me and about five other people are covering climate change every day as the emergency that it actually rightly is. Maybe there's more than five. I'm, I'm, I'm just being, you know, dramatic, but very few people are talking about climate change in the way that it needs to be talked about every single day uh, <clears throat> as the news that is deserving this attention. Uh, judging by the climate coverage to date, most of the U.S. news media still don't grasp the seriousness of this issue. Uh, really? There's a runaway train racing towards us, and its name is climate change. That is not alarmism. It is a scientific fact, and that's really all that needs to be known. And anybody that says it's alarmism needs to be... L- Figuratively and literally slapped in the face. We as a civilization urgently need to slow the train down and help as many people off the tracks as possible. It's an enormous challenge, and if we don't get it right, nothing else will matter. The U.S. mainstream news media, unlike major news outlets in Europe, and independent media in the U.S. have played a big part in getting it wrong for many years. It's past time to make amends. Uh, You can't solve a problem by ignoring it. Moderators did not ask presidential candidates a single question about climate change during the three primetime general election debates in 2016 or in 2012 or 2008 or ever. News stories about Hurricane Maria's devastating devastation of Puerto Rico, this spring's floods in the Midwest and other extreme weather events almost never mention climate change, though scientists have been drawing the connection for decades. Instead, human interest fluff prevails. In an 18-month period, TV and print outlets gave 40 times more coverage to the Kardashians and the acidification of oceans caused by rising temperatures, according to a 2012 report by the press watchdog Media Matters. 
The journalistic failure has given rise to a calamitous public ignorance, which in turn has enabled politicians and corporations to avoid action. I was just reading something about this yesterday, right? According to polls by Pew and others as recently as the 2016 presidential race, only half of the people in this country said that they thought that climate change was occurring occurring, and was attributable, attributable to human activities. And only 27% said they knew that almost all climate scientists held this view. The other half of the population said climate change was either not happening or was a result of natural cycles. <clears throat> this 50-50 split has existed <clears throat> since at least 2006. Um, <clears throat> the polls indicate by December 2018, the number of Americans who said they were somewhat worried about climate change had risen to 69%, in part because many had now experienced its effects. <laughs> right. Oh, what's that outside my window? Is it climate change? Hello, is that you? Still, only 29% said they were very worried, though very worried is exactly how most climate scientists have long felt. All right, this is an extremely long article, guys. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just wanted to give you an overview. But, I, you know, you guys get the gist, right? You get the point <laughs> that I'm trying to say or make or whatever. <clears throat> Uh, let me see. I think I got another super chat. Cougar W. Thank you for the super chat. Radical transformation is weakness. It all must end full stop. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. You know, this whole transform, transform our economy, transform our, our energy systems, <clears throat> man, they can't even, they can't even get the language right around this. Uh, you know, the, the only thing that Biden is putting forward on the DNC, on his platform, or, you know, the DNC is putting forward, the only redeeming thing he has to talk about is climate change, which is good, which is, hey. But it's entirely about jobs. The whole thing is about build back better. <laughs> We're going to make these green jobs, you know. It's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. Making stuff and building stuff and... Buying stuff and selling stuff, right? That's the whole, all of that stuff is killing the planet. Hey guys, remember to like, share, and subscribe, and you can support the channel. The links below uh, PayPal, Patreon, Square. Uh, also, if you'd like to watch the live streams, you can watch the live streams on my Patreon channel. You can subscribe for as little as a dollar. Um, so hopefully, I will see you over there.